We're back here on Here the Turtle with the new head coach of Maryland baseball. His name is Matt Swope. Swope, you've now had a few weeks to reflect on that. And as you said, you're working, you're working long hours right now putting everything together. What has this entire process been like for you from when, you know, Damon brought you in to, to offer you the gig till right now? What's this couple of weeks been like? Man, I don't even know if it's settled in yet. Uh, I've just been hitting the ground running, working immediately. Um, you know, it was it was surreal. I was the night before Damon called, uh, Rob had called me and then my air conditioner went out. So we had no AC that night. So I didn't sleep. And then Josh calls me and said, can you be in here in 45 minutes on Monday morning? So I said, sure. So from that point, Sunday to Monday to the press conference Wednesday to even now, I don't even know how many days it's been since then. It's been a whirlwind. So I just been hitting the ground running with staff, recruits, um, all those different things. And um, I'm sure at some point here in maybe a month, I'll be able to sit down and, and have it all, you know, settle in. But it just it just seems all so surreal right now. So if I think the really cool thing about you is that you're, you know, you're a Maryland guy through and through. And Taylor and I both went here and this place means a lot to us. You've been around here forever, grew up around here. Just talk about what what this school and this and your program specifically means to you. Yeah, it's everything. Uh, you know, I talked about it in the press conference. It's I've been coming here since I was born. Both my parents went here. Uh, Dad was in Sigma Chi. They got married in the chapel on campus at Maryland. Um, I spent my childhood going to football games and basketball games and, and being shaped by here. Um, I drove on Route One every day to go to high school. Um, so it's everything. Uh, having to know you know, where LaFrac is and where my criminal justice classes were and the steps and, and, and all that stuff. And my locker room was in VTH. It, it gives you the ability to just be genuine. Um, and that's when I tell people, this is a lifestyle to me. Um, I'm at the football games every weekend with, with Steve Suter, who's one of my best friends and Todd White. And, um, you know, those types of things are things I've been doing my entire life. So when you feel like this isn't a job and it's a lifestyle based off that, um, it, it's, it's almost becomes just more second nature than anything. When you look at that in the context of Maryland baseball as a program, as you said, you know, you played here, you've now been on the staff in a variety of capacities and now are the head coach. What kind of defines Maryland baseball to you? I feel like under coach Backage, coach chef, you know, Rob, and now you, there's sort of a through line of that kind of like blue collar mentality that this program brings, but you've kind of lived that for, for 20 plus years. What is Maryland baseball as an idea to you? Yeah. You just have to be willing to work and grind it out. I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, people know, I mean, the, the camp, the campus and where the field is, is fantastic, but you're, you're not going to get somebody that wants to come here for the glitz and the glam or, you know, the shiny things or the money and all that. So we've always had an identity here in Maryland, even from when I played, of getting guys that just want to work. Um, and I think that's that's what we've gotten over the years with Lamont Wades and Lau and, and guys like that that have progressed and Kevin Smith uh, to the point now with Shaw, LaRusso, and Shig, they're all kind of cut from the same cloth. Uh, they're interested in how you're going to make them better and you know, from a standpoint of having a great experience at school, but how you're going to develop them on the field and, and have them help live out their dreams. And I think we've done a really good job of that. So you know, I, I don't really like the cliches of, of the blue collar and all that. But, you know, when you're going through the recruiting process, you know, we give homework assignments. We, 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 we make them work for it. It's not us convincing them about the school or the shiny things. It's how is this going to be a fit between me and that recruit? And are they willing to put in the work? Because if you don't have trust early in that process, you can't be hard on them when you're here. So if you don't have that trust, they're not going to get better. So that trust has to be established early and you're really finding out about that personality and if they can be a worker um, and that kind of gym rat per se. And how cool has it been for you to kind of be with the program as it's risen to the point where you guys, you know, just won the Big Ten back to back years, hosted a regional last year. And I know you talked about in your press conference how how sweet a moment that was for you what has kind of the rise of this program been like for you as a part of it yeah for me it's more most people don't know even you guys that are a tick younger what it really was when I played here you know having four scholarships and a nine team ACC was a juggernaut then you know most people just don't realize they, they see the product now and they just think oh they're good right you know this just happened 
you know, no, it didn't happen mm -hmm. like that. So to see that from when I played um, to the investment kind of from a coaching staff and Eric Backage to Chef to Rob, you know, that's why I give a lot of credit to Eric. You know, he was the one to kind of turn the tide of, no, we're not going to be this Maryland baseball doormat or we're not thought of of a baseball school anymore. No, like, you know, forget that. We're going to move forward. So to see us make that rise in the last 11, 12 years since I've been here, like I said, when we hosted that regional, I was in tears going out to coach third base in that first inning because I have seen how far we have come. Uh, we still have that much more to go. I feel like, and that much more, we can take that next step. And uh, we haven't gotten close to peak. And I love Eric Backich. I love John Chef, and I love Rob Vaughn. But this is a destination job for me. This is this is not something I'm looking to take another step. I could have already done that at the major league level or somewhere else. So I'm here to build it, and, and I'm here to to take Maryland baseball hopefully to that to that next step. Cass can speak to the fact that on the while you were running out to third base, I was sitting at a bachelor party in Dewey Beach, forcing everyone to come watch the first game because of how much how how much it meant and getting emotional about it because seeing you guys uh, achieve that was was very very cool. Yeah, Taylor was also in tears in, in, our, <laughs> in our couch in Dewey Beach, and a few drinks might have a few drinks might have played a role in that. But Taylor, yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> know if that was the Dewey or the emotion. It was definitely a combo. God, definitely, definitely a combo. Um, you, you talked about it a little bit that you've had opportunities, you know, to potentially go elsewhere, especially um, with what you've done offensively the last few years. And, and the numbers have been repeated many times. I don't think I need to go through them. But I'm interested in sort of the origin of, of your hitting philosophy and how you've gotten it to this point where it seems like you guys are able to bring, you know, Elijah Lambros is a great example. You guys are able to bring someone in that has the raw talent um, that, you know, is highly regarded, comes from South Carolina, and you were able to kind of piece together what he needed for himself specifically. What has that process for you been like? Obviously, someone you were a great hitter in, in college and have watched a lot of guys and learned on a lot of people. But how did you kind of bring this philosophy into, into the fore? Yeah, I've always been a, a savage learner, meaning, you know, if there was something out there in baseball to be learned, I had to know. Whether I agreed with it or not, I just wanted to make sure that I had all the knowledge. So, you know, three years ago, we had a pretty good season, made a regional final at ECU. Um, and I was feeling really good about myself and I was studying brain types, six, there's 16 brain types. And I was down that rabbit hole studying brain types and how to specify it with your team. And some people need feedback this way. Some need other ways. And I got introduced to somebody in France, um, about motor preferences. So motor preferences are each individual's unique body language. So I went down this rabbit hole for basically the last two, two and a half years studying this, um, with the lab in Switzerland and it's changed my life. I literally changed everything after that 21 season, um, bought into the motor preferences. And, and what that essentially does is I'm able to identify between 10 and 13 categories, specifically in baseball, how someone wants to move. So everything we do with every player is individualized. There is no buckets. There is no, it's Matt Swope's way. It's, it's we're finding what ways they want to do things. And this can apply to all sports. Um, and it's changed my life. So I've bought an all into that. And what it's done is it allows us to keep that niche of like, we're truly going to develop you and I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and show you where other teams can't do that. Um, but, it, but it also doesn't allow that it's Matt Swope's opinion versus the kid. It allows that everybody's dif different and that specificity is very empowering to an athlete. Um, every athlete, all they ever wanted to know was what they should be doing. Um, and for the first time, maybe anything I've ever experienced in my life, um, we're able to do that. And nobody in college baseball and nobody in Major League Baseball can do this. We're the only people doing this in the United States. I'm interested. So let's, like, your big guys this year, LaRusso, Shaw, Schliger, yep. talk about how, like, so you're individualizing things for those three guys. Like, what's different about what you're doing for, for your, like, top hitters on the team? Yeah, so they're, they're all different. So Shig, uh, Shaw and LaRusso actually have similar profiles. So uh, Shaw and LaRusso prefer the weight in their forefeet, kind of like Taylor Smythe. Like you're not going to get <laughs> – no, you do. You're very aerial. No, you're the no most, doubt. You're, you're marked aerial. So uh, just it starts with the premise of where humans like their feet more forward or more backwards, and it kind of stems out from there. So, um, 
you know, Shaw and LaRusso or Ariel, right? Which most scouts or a lot of people in the United States don't like to see that because they want to see them in their heels to torque all these different baseball terms. So they have similar profiles in that, but where they're different is one prefers their members close to the body. One prefers away. So that's going to show where their contact point is, um, where Shig is a ground up mover, pelvis more tuck. So, I mean, I could sit here and get in the specificity mm-hmm. for each guy and know what their mode of preferences are, but you have to adapt to them. You know, even like Smythe will prefer more stiff soles. He needs a stiffer sole because he's off the ground quicker. He doesn't need the ground where I hug the ground. So even to the soles, how they tie their shoes, all these different things, it's literally everything. So taking that specificity and empowering that that individual, um, you just can't argue with the numbers. I mean, they're great players. They're elite players, you know, but they weren't top five or top 10 rounders out of high school either. So, you know, you see the empowerment of this stuff and, and all you're trying to do, it doesn't make you more talented, but the, the player and the coach and everybody knows you're maximizing that talent um, and you're giving it, you know, with the freedom of how their body wants to new to move, not some, some opinion or some philosophy. It's it's interesting to the that space that you work in from a hitting standpoint, baseball is so opinionated and everyone has their thoughts. What has been the reception to this overall philosophy you've done? Because as you said, you can't argue with the numbers and how guys have gotten markedly better, not only like the Shaws who, you know, come in and are immediately good in college, but you know, also the more, you know, unheralded guys like a Kevin Keister or someone like that 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 have also been good. What has been the reception that you've gotten? Because obviously someone like Lamont Wade is flying to Maryland every off season to work with you on this stuff. So clearly people are paying attention. Yeah, it's not been great. Um, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, listen, I, I think anytime that you're open to everything and, and you're, you don't have a narrative and because that's what this is, it doesn't have a narrative. It doesn't have an opinion. The opinion is you. And that's not how this world is. So from a hitting standpoint, from a pitching standpoint, from a conditioning standpoint, from a mental aspect, there's just too many silos and buckets. And that's what I'm trying to change. Um, Listen, I'm, I'm judged based off wins and losses. You know, I'm not, I'm not paid by having an opinion. So it's easier for me to say, Hey, here's what I'm doing. And here's the information you can take it or like it. So I have talked to at least half of the major league organizations. You know, I work with 10 other major league clients. Um, They've been open. It's just not not necessarily want to, what they want to hear. So you guys are very well versed in biomechanics and data. But the problem is in biomechanics and data, it doesn't take your brain into account. So biomechanics are just ranges of motion and measurements. There doesn't take your brain. So your brain, like Taylor Smythe, his brain wants to coordinate, you know, and his forefeet. And he, you know, so your posterior extensile muscles and your back and your calves protect you from falling over. That's non-negotiable. If I try to make you hit in your heels and run in your heels, you're going to get hurt and you're going to be slower. So it's more a matter of trying to change that dogma and try to change people's perception on, hey, let's just let's just say there's there's a way to do something different because the five hundred million dollars on the injury report, in Major League Baseball. I mean, we have all these data specialists and information, but well, how come nothing's changing? So um, I'm doing my best. We just wrote a book. Uh, that'll come out, um, and you know, in a couple months, and um, hopefully, we're just opening some eyes. Because my only goal is to help people. Um, that's it. Just kind of open everybody's eyes and help people and grow the game. Um, we've, you know, we've mentioned him a few times now. Matt Shaw projected to be a first round, first round um, draft pick in the MLB draft in a few weeks. What makes his overall game so special? And he's just the most meticulous human I've ever met. Uh, he drinks honey 11 minutes before the game starts. Um, he probably can tell you exactly when he went to bed for the last month. Um, it's the most deliberate thing I've ever seen. Um, so he's meticulous. He cares. He's passionate. Uh, he's a great human being at that. I've never seen – So I took it for granted this year because we had some good players. But I would look over, and the kid is just even keel. I mean, the entire season – the Every game, up or down, he's rooting for his teammates, even when he strikes out. That is not easy to do when you're the Cape Cod League MVP and you're projected to be a first-rounder. I don't care who you are. That is not easy to do. And he did it every day, the entire season, and didn't waver at all. So I'm most proud of him for the type of person he is. 
Um, I'm going to fly off and be with him on, on the ninth at the draft. And I'm excited to, to celebrate with him because he deserves everything he's about to get. And, uh, you know, uh, he's a surefire big leaguer, in my opinion. Um, he's one of the most advanced players I've ever seen um, coaching at this level in his age. We'll go through them a little bit here. Nick LaRusso put together one of the the really great offensive seasons in all of college baseball this year. Obviously, the RBI total spoke for themselves, but, you know, even what he did off of projected first rounder and Rhett Lauder and the regional, I mean, it had to have opened some eyes. What makes him special and why, why has he been overlooked? It felt like he could have easily been a draft pick last year based on what he put together. Yeah, I think, you know, when you come in that lineup, I mean, we had probably the greatest offensive year in the history of our school, you know, and you can argue this year was comparable, but sometimes it gets lost, right? If, if you're the best player on a team and you hit, you know, 330 with 16 home runs, you're like, uh, that's a draft guy. That's what he did. I mean, that guy came, transferred, and hit fourth every game in the best lineup in Maryland baseball history. So I think it was more of a – he got a little overlooked. And, and you know, maybe some of it what well, he was pitching too, you know. So you're pitching, you're hitting – Maybe you're not valued. And, you know, this year in a rare instance where he's only 22 still, he's physically better. He's a better player. It's not just, hey, the metrics are the same or, or he's physically a better player. So someone that's really bought into the motor preferences and taken that next step, uh, he's physically better. So he, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. Um, Shig last year, I didn't see many lulls throughout the entire season. And then LaRusso was very similar this year. Just one of the most unbelievable seasons put together ever I've ever witnessed. And he is such a, again, an incredible person, a human. I'm so thankful to have coached him. One of my favorite players of all time. And again, he has self-made going from that to possibly like a third to fifth rounder. He could walk into double A right now and hit third or fourth for anyone. You, you just mentioned him, Luke, Luke Schlager. What makes him so special? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's funny because I just keep talking about these guys almost like this, <laughs> this coach keeps talking about these players. Are they really that good? I really believe our one, two, three lineup was better than anybody's in the country. Anyone's. I don't care who it is. One, two, and three. And I know you just saw LSU. I know you saw those guys. But one, two, and three. You know, they're the best I've ever seen in their own niche. And what I mean by that, Shig's a leadoff guy, right? Having someone over a 500 on base for, for two straight seasons, uh, broke the individual season runs record, broke the, you know, total career run record, um, and was just an, an elite leadoff guy. His bat to ball, his hand eye um, was just on another level. So I'm excited to – and I think he can take a next step in the major league level, so I'm most excited to kind of see how he grows here in the next year or two. But, again, I, you know, I just can't say enough about all three of those guys. Obviously, he wore number three as the captain, too. Uh, and that says a lot about him being around those other guys. So um, I, don't, they're just, they're, I don't know if I'll ever, for the rest of my life, ever coach – someone like that like those those three guys one two and three I just don't know that just it's so special it just doesn't come just doesn't come along that often so let's look forward a little bit you've now put together um pretty much your your whole coaching staff here um and you bring in two you know two local guys uh John Poss and Jimmy Jackson just talk about those guys um and what they bring to the table um as we move forward here yes I wanted to bring guys that were were going to have some sustainability and that cared about Maryland baseball uh, Jimmy's, uh, you know, from Glen Burnie, uh, coached at Spalding. Uh, he went to Old Mill, so he's he's a local guy. His his mom still lives here. I think that matters. He grew up wanting to come here. He grew up a fan of Maryland. It didn't work out for him, but you know, having guys that 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 want to be here. Um, so excited for just that part of it. But obviously, being an associate head coach at JMU, he's earned it. Uh, producing some big leaguers at JMU is not an easy thing from a pitching staff that shows his prowess to recruit and recognize talent and then develop it as well. So, you know, he was a no brainer. Uh, one of the first people I thought of, obviously, when, when, when I thought I may get the job. And um, then again, just Johnny Poss is, is someone that's a local guy. He started the college baseball team at Wilson college and been a head coach there for six, uh, six years. So he's literally had to build that. And, and when you're talking about D3, 
you know, it's really hard to recruit that because all these guys want the D1. They think they're this. You know, you really have to grind it out. You really have to be persistent and do your due diligence to get guys to go to D3 because they, they never want to give that up, that dream of playing D1. So um, both of those guys are relentless recruiters, um, no doubt. And then just bumping Tommy up um, at some point is great. You know, working with the infielders, he's a young coach. Again, another guy that played here. Uh, he's been in the program as the player development guy uh, last season. So I think we've uh, established a staff that, that really cares, uh, that will do a great job in the area, and that will develop uh, players. Has there been a moment in the last two or three weeks where it hit you and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm the head coach of Maryland baseball? Maybe a few times. Maybe maybe the first time I had to sit in, in a different office. I think that always hits you a little bit when you're taking calls or doing something in a different office. It hits you. And then when you're doing recruiting calls you know, or something, I may catch myself in a conversation where now I get to, I get to put it on me, per se. You know? um, so, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I have not had time to, to let it sink in. But in this business, you don't. Um, you know, right now with the portal and, and the landscape of things changing in college, right, where even our own uh, roster, that was the focus number one, was making sure you contact all them and, and get that straight and making sure everybody's on the same page. And, um, you know, so I, like I said, I'm, in a month from now, hopefully I'll be able to take a vacation and sit on the beach or maybe go to Dewey with Smythe and, and relax. <laughs> but, but until then, um, we're working. Would love that. Would love to take that trip to Dewey. Uh, so we'll talk about talk about that roster construction piece a little bit because college baseball is one of the most interesting ones. You have players from all over the place, not only at the D one level, but you're talking JUCO, you're talking D two and D three that have developed and could potentially play D one baseball. Then you're dealing with your own recruits who could get drafted or do whatever they want to do, and then you're dealing with your own players getting drafted or not. What's that sort of? As you said, it's 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 been a, a whirlwind. But what's the roster construction look like for you as you sit here on June 29th? Well, first and foremost, you got to make sure that the roster for the next season is competitive. And when you have a weird situation in college um, where juniors can get drafted, you know you're, you're not counting on four year guys. So you got Shig, Shaw, Larusso, uh, you got Savical, you got you got other guys that are that are fringe guys. Um, you know, your immediate thought is to that. You know, and then you tear down. We've been so prepared over the years. We have a 24 class, a 25 class, a 26 class, and you have commits in all those classes, and none of them flipped. So, you know, we're in a good shape for the future, but with the dynamic of how it's changed with the portal and, and guys having the ability to leave, uh, even more of a reason why you have to cultivate good relationships while they're here. Um, turnover is just going to happen in, in this business because – it's not always a negative thing. Maybe maybe a kid just didn't get an opportunity and he he deserves that and wants that somewhere else. That's, that doesn't mean he didn't like the coaches or he, he didn't like Maryland. It just means he wants a chance to play. And that's a good thing. You know, that that, that doesn't make him feel stuck. And and you're seeing it from both sides. I mean, coaches can leave. I mean, they, they can take a better job and do the same thing. So you have to just know all those things can happen. And, and if you build relationships – if you build good relationships, good things are going to happen because everything's always going to come back to that. The baseball is baseball, but building good relationships with people is is what it's all about. And that's something that we're going to always pride ourselves on. It's definitely, you know, you mentioned no, no one flipped um, when the coaching change was made. How excited are, are you about this class um, and the team next year? Yeah, you know, we have a lot of guys coming in and we've also drastically changed it in the portal. Um so we've added five arms in the portal. We've added a couple bats, um, uh, all things that I think are going to help. Uh, we had some young guys leave. So, you know, that's what it is today. You know, it's it, that maybe used to be the JUCO route maybe, right, or, or things that were going that way. Um, we also had a couple late flips from a Florida State commit in Braden Martin, who's a Bowie kid that's really big, and then Chris Okopian um, from Wake that's coming. Uh, two elite, elite Maryland players that I'm so thankful to keep in state um, with Chris being able to play with his brother, Eddie. Uh, those guys are, are very, very good young players. So we did a, we did a good job of, of, you know, making sure we got some grad guys and some older guys that have weekend um, experience. And then we got some really good young guys that are coming in. So I'm excited for both. And, you know, when you won the championship and then lost the, 
the guys we're going to lose in the draft, it, it we may get slept on a little bit, but that, that'll be a good thing because I think we have a really good roster for next year. So when you look at the landscape of, of sort of the internal um, coaches that you now, you know, share head coaching duties with, I know you're, you know, really close with coach Tillman, you have a relationship with coach locks, you've got a relationship with pretty much everybody over the last few years, cause you've been here. What will, what will you try to take from some of those, you know, really, you know, a Sasha, a Missy, a Kathy, some of the really successful coaches around here. What is, what has been your conversations with some of those people like? I've been doing it for 12 years. It doesn't, it doesn't start when you're a head coach. I do it every day. I'm going to see Till later on tonight. Um, we're, we're going into an event together. And that's, that's part of what I'm talking about, where I prided myself on. I haven't waited to be a head coach, you know, having these conversations with all these head coaches and Locks's, you know, first job. I was actually playing here when he was at Maryland. So I've known him since then. Um, and, you know, being knowing people in your department very well in other places, I've been picking and, and, and taking things from people for, for my entire career to hopefully set me up for this time. And that's why I'm always so thankful for Coach Chef basically throwing me in the fire, allowing me to do, you know, what I need to do to learn that. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing that for 12 years. So maybe in a little bit of a different sense now with, with more specifics on NIL and um, things that conversations that may need to happen to, to grow that or we're still in the beginning stages that, that they can help me out with. But um, yeah, that's kind of been what I've prided myself on since, since being here. You definitely have a unique perspective on this because you've been around for so long. How have you seen this athletic department grow? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, first and foremost, from a baseball perspective, there just wasn't really the commitment um, just because we weren't good. I mean, why, I mean, I'm not going to lie. If I'm an administrator, why, why would I really invest in, in something, um, where it's, it's not coming to fruition. So I think that change coming from Eric's passion, um, is what I'm most thankful of. I mean, we've done a lot from the field perspective to the indoor that's about to be built to bringing in stands for a regional to, you know, we know we need to improve upon some things, but you know, it's definitely in the conversation now where, you know, 12 years ago, anybody that probably mentioned Maryland baseball was probably like, why haven't they cut that program yet and save the money type of thing? So um, the administration's done a good job. Um, I, I think as a whole, you've seen College Park drastically change. You know, 20 years ago when I went here, it, it was the same town for literally 30 years. Nothing changed. So even from that standpoint, the campus growing, the downtown area, the growth, uh, you see the, the profile of the academics go from skyrocket to a top 20 public school in the country. I think all those things coinciding with uh, the commitment um, from athletics and the facilities and all that. It's just no better time to be a Terp. So the one thing I always give credit is, is we're not we're still trying to grow. Uh, even as a university. And that's something that's really important, I think, for, you know, former players, alumni, fans, and, and whatever. So I'm just excited to, to kind of see where we go in the next five years. Give us your favorite Maryland game you've ever attended. My, my most memorable two games was, my first one was, I think I was nine, and it was Maryland basketball versus LSU. And at the time, LSU had, a person called Chris Jackson and he was lighting up the college ranks who people that are my age know ended up being Mahmoud Abdul Rauf in the NBA. So that was my first game that LSU was supposed to be really good. And it was a, a thriller. And I think LSU ended up winning by one or two points. And then another was an upset that at a football game where I said this in my press conference that I was going to storm the field and I didn't know if I was allowed, but the guy in the yellow jackets ended up letting him. And then I went down with Scott Milanovic and uh, was able to get his wristband that I still have in this, you know, my man cave down here. And so there's, there's, there's tons. I mean, I, I could go on and on and on and on about even into, you know, when I was in college and we went undefeated my senior year, Cole, the last year, Cole winning the national championship in basketball. I mean, I just, I can go back and forth about the usher that let me in for free. Um, when I was about five years old to 10, there was one usher at Cole field house that all I needed to do was have a piece of paper and hand it to him. And he let me in, in the standing room only. So <laughs> I, I, I have story after story after story I could go through, but 
like I said, all these things shaped my childhood and it wasn't based off baseball. It was, it was based off probably a lot of other things. Non-baseball, who are your favorite Maryland athletes you've ever watched? My favorite Maryland athletes are, are definitely, you know, growing up with Len Bias. I was a little young, but that's where it started. Someone who really, like I said, changed. I was, I was t- a teenager was Joe Smith. Um, uh, you can see his jerseys behind me right here. You got Joe Smith that's there. Uh, I was coming in my teenage years when they beat Georgetown that first time. We were coming off probation. Gary was building it. Georgetown was the, was the more popular team in the DMV. That was really something that for me, you know, captured my heart. And basketball was a big part of me growing up and going into the Matha. So uh, Joe Smith was definitely a favorite uh, of mine. Uh, I know Johnny Rhodes uh, very well. Dwayne Simpkins was also on that team, who's a DeMatha guy. So that was really one of those teams and, and players that that really just kind of captured my heart. Uh, give us the best Steve Souter story you have that is fit for air. Oh man, I was going to ask that same question, Taylor. You, you had to have <laughs> the aster, asterisk fit for air. Yeah. Um, there's two. Okay, so one one was in college and. You know, he was a little bit younger than me, but I was coming back finishing and hearing the stories about how strong he was. So I got to go witness actually in the weight room or, or, or shortly thereafter with video of him breaking the clean record all time in Maryland. So pound for pound, he's actually one of the strongest wide receivers in the history of, of the school. Um, and you wouldn't know that by necessarily looking at him, but he was a freak athlete. So That was one from an athletic standpoint. The other one was probably we played seven on seven when we were older, got out of college. And you just really don't realize until you're out there with someone like that when he actually played football and I was playing quarterback and throwing to him how elite he was. So it's more like athletically when it comes to that. Um, As a person, though, you guys know he does the radio. He's the most humble, um, genuine um, person I know, you know, and, and for being someone of that stature that had such a great career, just, just what a, a, just a cool dude, just a laid back guy, very genuine, um, very open and welcoming. So he's one of my best friends and, and, you know, I love him dearly. Yeah. Taylor and I get to spend some time with him on football road trips and, um, most of our stories are not fit for air prop, but uh... that, would be, that would be correct. <laughs> um, enjoy, enjoying the, enjoying Charlotte. Yes, he, we, we had a good time and we had a good time down in Charlotte. Uh, no doubt. What are usually we ask people their favorite place to eat in College Park? I want twofold from you. I want one, a place that's not here anymore that you miss, and two, a place that is here now that that's your favorite spot to go. One place I miss is probably Ratsy's. Uh, I miss rat. I miss Ratsy's <laughs> for probably all fair reasons. Um, and I, and I miss Smoothie King. So Smoothie King actually used to be on the corner where the new town, you know, city hall is. And that was like a staple, just always being around there. I know that, you know, you can get a smoothie anywhere and it's a chain, but I miss Ratsy's and Smoothie King. Oh, actually I really miss Santa Fe too. I miss Santa Fe. They used to have dollar wings on certain days. I really miss Santa Fe, the, the layout and all that stuff, which is now turf, but. I miss Santa Fe and still, man, I just, I got to do it. It's just the Bentleys, man. It's just, that's the, that's, that's the mothership, you know, that's, it's, it's shaped who I was. And I mean, I was going there with my dad growing up and um, even that with the Vue and Cornerstone. So those two places mean a lot to me um, from the lure and all that stuff, not just from maybe a quality standpoint, but you know, what it means to me growing up here and what it means to College Park and Scott Van Pelt too. (laughs) <laughs> I think that I think that's the right a jersey. Your jersey's up there, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. There you go. I, I, I mean, know. once you have your jersey up there, you can't pick anywhere else. No, and I don't know. Yeah, that wasn't necessarily all athletically based. So um, I, <laughs> I, I've been there a time or two. I think a good a good way to end it. Uh, Swope, thanks so much for coming on. When does the when does the book drop? Plug that real quick. When when is that coming out? Yeah, it's 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 in the editing process. That's one thing I've never dealt with before was getting that edited and then publishing. You have to self publish and, and do all this stuff. Um, so uh, hopefully a couple months. We're trying to expedite it right now, but excited to to kind of share the world with with what we're doing with motor preferences and looking forward to it.
That will be very cool. I'm excited. I know Maryland fans are very excited for the Matt Swobear as head coach and, and all that you've done and contributed to the program and to the school over your time here. Thanks for coming on with us, and uh, good luck the rest of the summer continuing to uh, drink through the fire hose, as you said. A lot going on. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, Swob. Great job, man.